Well, good morning. We are glad that you're joining us here online at Parkview. Would you worship with us this morning? I raise the hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise the hallelujah louder than the unbelief.
we recognize the value of relationships, it's our relationship with Jesus that we want to think about now as we prepare to share communion together. And we want to invite all Christians where you are to gather together uh, some bread or cracker and some grape juice if you have it, and gather your family together and prepare to share in the Lord's Supper together. This is uh, a moment that Jesus instituted with his disciples as a way for them and for us to remember him. And each week as we gather together, we take time to clear out the distractions and focus our hearts and minds on Jesus And remember with thankful hearts the sacrifice that he made for us to bring us into relationship with him. The sacrifice he made on the cross as he shed his blood to pour out grace and forgiveness to us as an expression of his love so that we could belong to him both now and for eternity. So I'd invite you as he invited his disciples and we follow their example to take a piece of bread as he broke it and shared it with them and said, take it and eat, this is my body. Let's eat together and remember Jesus. And he took the cup and shared it among them and said, this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And we drink together and remember the grace that comes to us by the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we come with grateful hearts, thinking about you, about the relationship that we have with you because you loved us enough to lay down your life for our sins. And right now, Lord, we are reminded of the value of that relationship we have with you as we experience the strength of your presence, the peace that comes by your spirit. Lord, we're grateful for that. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I also want to... uh, invite you to share in a time of offering. And on our website, we have a link to online giving so that you can give here at Parkview. And I want to remind you that we care about missions. And Parkview gives 15% of our general offering to missions locally, regionally, and around the world. And we are grateful for your support of the ministry that takes place here and the support of the missionaries that we uh, participate with around the world. If you want to go on our website, you can also find a missions page, and there are links there to give you information about each of the missionaries that we support. We'd also like to continue praying for you. This has been a, a, a wonderful time of prayer as I've been lifting you and your family up. And uh, I would love to be praying for you, the specific needs that you might have. So if you go to the staff page on our website, you can click on my picture and send an email in to me or to anyone else in the office and let us know about the prayer requests that you have. And we would love to share those with the leadership here at the church so that we can continually be praying for you. As we continue our sermon series on the disciples today, we're going to talk about the life of Judas Iscariot. Now, what I find interesting about Judas is that throughout Scripture, when we read his name, there's a description tied to that name that indicates him as a betrayer. It's consistent throughout all of Scripture, and it reflects the same kind of image that we have about who he is. We don't know much about his upbringing or his background. The only thing we know about that is comes from his name, Iscariot, which means from Kerioth, which is the city where he grew up. Let's begin reading in John chapter 6 in verse 66 to gain more of an understanding about who Judas was. If you want to open your Bible with me and read along, you're welcome to do that. The words will also be on the screen. If you want to use the YouVersion app, you can open that and search under events for Parkview Finley and find scripture and sermon notes in the YouVersion app as well. Let's begin reading together. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Now, this story comes from early on in Jesus' ministry. It happened soon after Jesus fed the 5,000, the large crowd of people there. 
with the loaves of bread and the, the, the two fish. And after that, Jesus went across the lake with his disciples and began preaching on the mountainside there. And he began to say things about how he is the bread of life and that through him, people would find eternal life. He began to say that he would replace the manna of the Old Testament, the the bread that sustained the people of Israel. And in fact, he went so far as to say that if the people wanted to have eternal life, they would need to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And these words were difficult for the people to hear. And many of the people who had said before, yes, I want to be a disciple. I want to follow and learn from your teaching. On hearing these words, decided to walk away from Jesus at this point. And Jesus turned to his disciples to find out if they too were going to walk away. And that's when Peter affirmed their commitment to Christ. And it's in this tender moment of commitment between Jesus and disciples that, again, we have this indication of how Judas would later betray Jesus. I find it interesting to see that Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. And sometimes I forget about how Jesus is all-knowing, and he would have been aware of the fact that Judas was going to betray him. He knew what was coming, and yet that didn't hinder the relationship that Jesus had with him at this point. He didn't cause Judas to, to leave the group of disciples. He didn't ostracize them in any way. Judas was given every opportunity to make his own decisions and choose for himself. It was up to him. Now, there would be many opportunities for Judas to step off the path that he was on and choose to align himself with Christ. In fact, that's the way of life, isn't it? As we seek to follow the Lord, there are forks in the road. There are branches in the path. And every day, every moment of every day, we come to a point of decision in which we have to choose the direction of our lives. If we will continue following faithfully after the Lord or if we will make a decision to step off that path because of a distraction or a temptation or a different path that we want to take in life. Unfortunately, we see how the rest of Judah's story unfolds. Most of the events that take place leading up to the death of Jesus on the cross involve Judas and his betrayal. Uh, The beginning of all this is found in John chapter 12 as we begin to get a hint of what Judas is capable of. Beginning in verse 1, it says this, Six days before the Passover... Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Here in this story, we see how Judas faced temptation. And the temptation that was present and prevalent in the life of Judas was greed. And this is the first indication that we see of that greed coming to light in the way that he lived his life and the impact that it had on the people around him. Mary took an expensive bottle of perfume and used it to anoint Jesus' feet. This action drew an immediate response from Judas. And he responded harshly to what she had done. And this strong reaction revealed the true value of his heart. He objected to such a wasteful, extravagant expression. Where Mary was simply pouring out this perfume as an act of love and worship to Jesus. But Judas saw the loss of what that perfume could have purchased. Now Matthew and Mark tell us that all of the disciples were opposed to this action. But it's Judas who spoke up from what John tells us here. And he put a nice spin on his reaction saying that, well, the money from that perfume could have been used to help the needy, to give to the poor. And he criticized Mary, refusing to acknowledge that Jesus was worth this kind of expression. And when Jesus responded to Judas, he didn't respond to what was on Judas's heart. He responded to what Judas said out loud. And he told Judas that this perfume was intended to be used on his body for burial anyway. 
and that it was Mary's decision about what she would do with it, and Judas needed to leave her alone. He said, you will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. Now, this is a simple encounter, and yet it speaks to the nagging temptation that was present in Judas' life, the greed that was driving him, the desire for wealth. When John wrote the events of the story, he recounted some insight in his writing that he may not have known at the time that it all took place, that that while Judas was responsible for the purse, the collected money of the disciples and Jesus that was used to pay for their expenses, to give to the poor, Judas was responsible for all those things. And maybe he had a background in finance. Maybe he was one of the biggest among the disciples and they felt that the money would be safe with him. But even though he was responsible, he was taking advantage of the fact that the money was at his disposal and he would take from that purse and line his own pockets. And greed was already taking hold of his heart. And from this story, this is the last time we hear about Judas before we step into the events leading up to the cross. And there's no other motive given as to why Judas might have betrayed Jesus. And so we're left to connect the dots and see that his greed drove his betrayal. When we look to Matthew chapter 26, we continue the story and gain a little bit more of an understanding, beginning of verse 14. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests. He asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Now we see that Judas is acting on his temptation. Judas went out and found an opportunity to negotiate with the chief priests on a price that they would pay him to hand Jesus over to them. Now they had been waiting for an opportunity to kill or discredit Jesus for quite some time. And now, Judas, one of Jesus' own disciples, walked into their midst, ready to create an opportunity to hand Jesus to them. And the price that they were paying Judas was much less than that perfume was even worth. And yet it was still enough money to tempt Judas to cause him to turn his back on Jesus. This negotiation speaks to Judas' motivation He didn't ask the chief priest for a position among the leadership of the Jews. He didn't ask for prestige or honor. He asked for money. What are you willing to give me to hand Jesus over? The story continues in John chapter 13. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go on to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Now this last evening together that Jesus shared with his disciples was a meal that they shared in an upper room. It had been prepared in advance for them as one last event before Jesus would lay down his life. And Jesus began this meal by washing his disciples' feet. And I find it interesting that Jesus continued to love and serve them all. Judas was a part of this group. Jesus knew what he had been doing and what he was going to finish doing. And yet, His unconditional love is seen in how he included Judas in this group. And his unconditional love is seen in how, as he continued working with his disciples, caring about them and serving him, that he would also point Judas to recognize the truth about his sin and confront him with what he was doing. Jesus would identify Judas among the 12 as the one who would betray him. And in each situation that we see leading up to this betrayal. We see the greater impact of this deception that it would have on his relationships between Judas and the disciples, between Judas and Jesus, and even the damage that it would cause within Judas himself. We think about the, the duplicity involved. For Judas to have already taken money from the chief priests and yet still sit among the disciples with Jesus sharing in this meal together, allowing Jesus to wash his feet He would have to compose himself 
among the disciples to mask his true intentions, to smile and agree to the things that they were saying, knowing in the back of his mind that he had already put in motion his plan to betray Jesus. Later in the chapter, while still in the upper room, the story continued as Jesus let the disciples know that he was aware of what Judas was planning to do. In verse 18, Jesus said, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Now Judas could no longer hide his sin. He had been singled out by Jesus in front of the rest of the disciples, identified as the one who would betray him. And Judas left immediately. He went out of the upper room. He left the the group that was gathered there. Why did he leave? Did he leave because he could no longer stand to look in the face of Jesus? He could no longer look into his eyes? Did he leave because he thought maybe the disciples would begin to question him and interrogate him about how he might betray Jesus or why Jesus would point him out? And afraid of what those questions might sound like, he left so that he wouldn't have to face those other men. Or maybe he left because having been identified, he knew that he would only have one last chance to fulfill his plan and get paid fulfilling his end of the bargain from the chief priests. What we do know is that his sinful behavior kept him from experiencing an incredible moment shared between Jesus and the disciples. And after Judas left the upper room is when Jesus had the Lord's Supper and implemented with those disciples the means by which they would remember him. And they would pass this on to the church and to believers so that we can remember Jesus And it is through this sharing of the Lord's Supper that relationship with Jesus is honored and remembered on a weekly basis with special emphasis. After leaving the upper room, Jesus took the disciples down to the Garden of Gethsemane where he spent time in prayer. And this is where Judas had arranged for the chief priests to make their move. Taking no chances, Judas went with them himself, leading the crowd who would arrest Jesus. In Matthew 26, verse 47, we read how this happened. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. Now this was the moment that Judas had prepared for. He'd been paid to arrange this meeting. He'd worked out a signal to identify Jesus, and his clever plan was unfolding. And even as he accomplished his victory, He heard Jesus say, do what you came for, friend. Can you imagine the emotions that would have swept over Judas in that moment, leaning in close to Jesus and hearing him say those words? Was it guilt, shame, fear, remorse, regret? Was it a combination of all of those things? It must have been unbearable standing in the face of Jesus doing such a despicable thing. He not only sold Jesus to the chief priests, 
He had sold his own integrity and turned his back on the Lord. In chapter 27, beginning of the first verse, we read the result of what Judas was feeling. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I've sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, well, it's against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That's why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Now this passage helps us to understand the full realization that took place within Judas while he had made decisions along the way that led him further and further down the wrong path, there was a point in which he recognized that he was wrong, that he had sinned. And he admitted his sin and motivated by remorse, tried to alleviate his conscience by giving the money back to the chief priests, the money that he had taken to betray Jesus. Now the nature of the chief priests is revealed more clearly in their response. They gave him no opportunity to make amends or to pass blame onto them. They refused to acknowledge any wrong. Driven by his overwhelming guilt and remorse, Judas took his own life. He removed himself from faithful service. He stepped away from his relationship with Jesus. He refused to humbly accept his responsibility and work for the good of the kingdom. Instead of seeking mercy and grace, he ended his own life. His decisions spiraled out of control. And while his failure removed him from service to the Lord, what we see is that God's plan continued. It continued to unfold in the world around them. There would be another who would step in and take his place as the apostles gathered together in the book of Acts, the last time we read Judas' name in Scripture, we read about how the apostles gathered together before they implemented the, the beginning of the church. And they gathered together and acknowledged the fact that where they had once been 12, they needed to be 12 again, and someone would need to step forward and take Judas' place. And so they decided to call up men who had been with them from the beginning, men who had called themselves disciples, followers of Jesus, though they weren't among the 12, and they found two men who fit the description and they cast lots between them. And Matthias was chosen to become an apostle, to fulfill the role that Judas might have fulfilled. Judas' life stands out as in stark contrast to the lives of the other disciples. Where Judas chose to betray Jesus, the others made decisions each and every day to remain faithfully devoted to the Lord. Some of the decisions that they made were overt decisions. They were yes decisions to stay on the path following Jesus. Some of those decisions were, were overt no decisions as they said no to the temptations of life that would pull them away from the Lord, as they said no to the, to the distractions that would keep them from faithful obedience. And yet there were other decisions that were more subtle, words that they spoke, attitudes that they held, pieces of their character that they chose to strengthen their resolve to stay on the right path following Jesus. See, discipleship calls us to continually choose faithful obedience. Now, there will always be decisions in our lives. There will always be moments for us to choose who we are and who we want to be. Every day, every moment of every day, we are forced with intersections in our path. Decisions that will either lead us on the path that we're following, faithfully following after Jesus, or they will cause us to turn away from that path. They will tempt us and pull us away from the life that we hope to live in faithful obedience to the Lord. We'll have opportunities to decide where our future will take us and the kind of life that we will live. Now, the decision that we have 
towards discipleship is an important decision. It begins with our decision to accept the lordship of Jesus in our life as we accept him as Lord and Savior. And it's coupled with a commitment to be faithfully devoted to him. Now, this isn't a one-time decision that carries us through into the future. This is a daily decision, a continual decision that requires us to say yes to staying on the right path, following after the Lord and faithful devotion to him. It requires us to say no to temptation, to say no to distraction, to choose not to stray away from the life that the Lord is calling us to live. It also calls us to make more subtle decisions about what our attitudes will look like, how we treat the people around us, about the kind of words that we speak, about the character that we choose to embrace as we mold and shape our lives in the image of Christ. These decisions are daily decisions that determine our path. Now, if you look at the example of Judas, you'll see how he was faced with a variety of decisions. At one point in his life, he was asked by Jesus to follow Come and follow me. We don't read that in scripture, but that's the verbiage that Jesus used for the disciples that we do have a story of their calling. And for Judas, at some point in his young life, Jesus invited him to follow as a disciple. And Judas made the decision to leave his life behind and follow. Now, if you would go back and ask that Judas, do you think it's possible that you would turn your back on Jesus, that you would betray him and hand him over to be crucified, that young Judas would probably say, there's no way. I, 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 there's, I, I'm not capable of doing something that horrible to Jesus. And yet, after embracing temptation, after entertaining temptation, after choosing sin, Judas found himself in a place where not only was he capable he did betray Jesus to his death. That's the danger of temptation and sin. That's the danger of those decisions that we have to make each and every day. If we don't recognize the weight of those decisions, if we think, well, I'm not capable of doing that, it's so horrible, and we don't acknowledge that temptation is leading us toward that heinous sin. We stand in danger of falling and turning our lives down a very dangerous path. In James chapter one, we're told about the danger of temptation. Verse 13, he said this, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Now, James provides for us a warning and encouragement, a warning that sin begins with temptation and each of us will face temptation and have to make a decision about the direction of our lives. And we'll have to make a very clear decision to say no to temptation and say yes to faithfully obeying the calling of the Lord in our lives. And we cannot be successful if all we want to do is avoid sin, those decisions have to be motivated by our relationship with the Lord. Those decisions have to be a product of the love that we have for Jesus and the desire that we have to live our lives in obedience, faithfully devoted to his will and to his way. And that requires us to make continual decisions in our lives, to stay on the path, to choose to grow in our relationship with him, and to live life the way he calls us to. That decision begins with the decision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I want to ask you to think about where you are in your relationship with Jesus. If you've never accepted him as Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to do that this morning, that by believing in his name, having faith that he forgives sins, that you would confess him as Lord and Savior, repent of your sins and be baptized in his name. And if you're already a Christian, I would encourage you to evaluate where you are in your relationship with the Lord right now. If you're in a place where you know that you've been straying from the path, that the choices of your life have been leading you into dangerous places, I wanna challenge you 
to acknowledge that this morning, to confess those things to the Lord and to allow him to help you to begin making the right decisions, to come back to that straight and narrow path as you reaffirm your commitment to the Lord to live faithfully devoted to him, to grow in discipleship and to see what the future has in store according to his will. Let me pray for you in the, those decisions that you're making. God, I want to ask that you would be with the people of Parkview, that you would give them the strength to make difficult decisions, that you would give them the courage and the peace to identify the path that you have called them to and to remind them of your presence as they walk along that path, as they face difficult decisions on a daily basis, that you would be there with them, that you would provide a way for them to escape temptation, that you would provide for them everything that they need to remain faithfully devoted to you, that you would help them grow in that relationship, that you would help them to discover the life that is truly life. We thank you for the relationship that we have with Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.